I'm James Eade of the Eade Foundation, but you could call me Jim. I'm getting off to a slow start today. You know, it's going to be the end of daylight savings time or the start of, I don't know. But there's a time change coming up, and I just uh, am all out of whack. I don't know why. But this is maybe the best time to announce that this is the season finale of The Chess Files. The answers are out there. And I've been doing this. This is the 52nd episode. So I thought it was fitting. Take a little break. Uh, but we will be back. Um, but in order to end the the season on a big uh, up note, I asked a special guest to come and talk about his career. I'm going to give you a little hint about who the guest is. Oh, the Chess Life. You know, I've never been on the cover of Chess Life. Oh, my gosh. This is just embarrassing but i'm going to ask john donaldson to join me right now john thank you hey, jim uh, thanks for having me oh yes you, you know john you and i share so many um chess stories let me just uh change my screen because it doesn't quite fit um into into my tiny little screen so i'm going to get a little background change here and that might look a little better so you know because i'm really fussy about how i look and <clears throat> but the thing is, John, uh, you know, our, we've had so much overlap in our chess careers, uh, but there's so many things that you have accomplished that I've had nothing to do with. And I wanted to ask you about some of those things um, to get started. I'd like to ask you, like, where are you from? Where do you live now? And how would you get started playing chess? Well, I uh, I'll, I'll start with a, with a, the latter question. I. Uh, uh, I was growing up in uh, Tacoma, Washington. Uh, my father was the city manager there, and uh, uh, I was—I sort of knew how to play chess. I—I uh, I wasn't yet acquainted with the ambassade rule, but the rest of it I sort of had mastered. And uh, uh, of course, in the summer of 1972, there was the Fisher Spassky match, and all my friends and I uh, uh, followed it. And uh, and that fall, I joined the Tacoma Chess Club, and. Uh, uh, that was a, a a very important moment in my life. That's what really got me started as a chess player, and I made a lot of friends there: uh, Eric Tangborn, Dan Bailey, oh, yeah. Salmon. Uh, uh, I just, uh, I'm, you know, not long after I met Yasser Sarawan, who was from Seattle but played in Tacoma. So that was really, uh, uh, you know, the first day I stepped into the Tacoma Chess Club in the fall of 1972. You know, I I, I think there were maybe over a hundred people in the club, you know, it was a Fisher boom and uh, there was a tournament going on. And uh, I remember coming home that evening and uh, my parents were, were, were alarmed because I just reeked of smoke. Those are the things <laughs> when you could smoke. And so my parents had thought I'd become a juvenile delinquent, you know, of and, course. Uh, yeah. overnight. so uh, I have a lot of memories of that time. Yeah. Well, you know, that's one thing we have in common. I played my first tournament game in 1972 for the same reason. You know, uh, the, it was part of the Bobby Fischer boom. But I think I'm uh, considerably older than you. I, I was born in 1957. No, no, you're just a year older. I was born in September 24th of 58. I always like to tell John Fedora I'm his older brother because I'm three days. I was born three days before him. There you go. Yeah. Well, you know, you just look younger. That's that's my grudge against you. Um, the, the thing is, John, uh, you got started playing and in Tacoma. So you, you think of that as your home, your Pacific that's, Yeah, that's where I grew up. I mean, my yeah. senior year of high school, I was uh, my father took another position, a larger position in uh, Cincinnati. And uh, that's when I, uh, 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 you know, that's where I graduated high school from. And I made a lot of friends there as well and had a really great time in the, and they had a very good chess club there as well. And, uh, then later, my father took a job as a zoo director in Philadelphia, and so that got me all the way to the East Coast. You know, most people work their way west, but my father, for some reason, worked his way east. Uh, 
go east, old man. <laughs> yes, yes. And then, and then, of course, later, thanks to you and Mark Pinto, I landed the position at the uh, Mechanics Institute Chess Club as the director. And that was in the fall of 1998. And that was definitely another one of those like really important moments in my life. Yes, you mentioned Mark Pinto. He's a trustee, a longtime trustee at the Mechanics Institute, um, a gem of the in the chess world, uh, a dedicated chess room. Uh, it's built into the, the charter, which is I think dating back to 1854 or something like that. That the mm -hmm. chess room is a public. It, it's a library, and um, so most of the floors are dedicated to uh, books or to you know renting out to clients and stuff like that. But there's a floor that's the chess room that is a uh, you know a special place and i was the director of that before you and but i was basically begging for you to take it and uh, mark and i approached you in hawaii i think the us open was in hawaii one year and we both independently tackled you and said please do this <laughs> yeah no no it was a really it was i it was uh, i the 20 years i spent at the mechanics were uh, quite memorable ones and uh, i'm very glad that uh, person that I passed the baton to, uh, uh, Abel Talamantes and his assistant, assistant uh, Dr. Judith Azare, uh, they've done a really fantastic job, especially through the pandemic and keeping uh, the me mechanics, you know, busy a as ever. I couldn't agree more. I've, I've had them both on at different times, uh, but what they've done during the pandemic, they, you know, the chess room itself was uh, shut down. So they, they kept the members the, the community alive through the online chess world and uh i just tip my hat to both of them for doing that um but john one of the things about your your um work in the mechanics and this is a general characteristic that i'm going to point out for, for our viewing audience hi mom uh is that you, you wrote um the history a, a history of the the chess room am i wrong in that or that's correct. Yeah. I mean, I was greatly assisted in, 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 in doing it by uh, the late Steve Brandwine, who did a lot of the research. Shout out to Steve Brandwine, wherever he is. Yes, I, I, uh, I absolutely adored him. And he was a great researcher. You know, if he, if he didn't know the answer, which was rare to your question, he would go look it up and come back to you and, and give you the answer. So, yeah, but um, that was a, a great book that I, I thought was uh it just you know you had the before the fire the great fire of 1906 which was the only time that wasn't the, in the, the continuously in operation well actually you, you, you're right in the sense that for a few weeks it was stopped and right. it is true that the building wasn't uh, uh you know refinished for a couple of years but the mechanics had a uh, a temporary fix where they had this pavilion where they they had other land that they owned that was outside of the fire zone and so they they uh, uh, set up a makeshift uh, 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 you know chess and and, and library uh, uh, for the transition between their older building and the new building they rebuilt on the same grounds yes so it's it's the oldest uh, continuing operating chess club in the United States is that that is that is definitely right I think uh, after that, it's tricky. Uh, the Franklin Mercantile, uh, the, the Franklin and the Mercantile, they merged in the 1950s. But I think both of them have histories before 1900. So they probably come in uh, second and or third or second, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the Marshall Chess Club, uh, you know, dates to about this, the First World War. Not at the current location, but, but they moved around. I think maybe 1914, they, they were founded in Keene's shop, shop house, a local steakhouse. And then they kind of moved around for a bit before they got their current home. And there have been other clubs also uh, that have, uh, uh, even even ones you, you'd think all the older clubs would be on the East Coast. Yes. But there's some like, you know, Portland Chess Club, Seattle Chess Club, they go a long way back. But the thing with them is it, it's kind of hard to trace their history because unlike the mechanics and unlike the Marshall, and unlike the mercantile, they didn't have their own building that they rented. So they were, you know, there were probably periods where they were temporarily out of action, uh, right. but it's, it's sort of impossible to track. That's why the, the Marshall and uh, the mechanics are, are such, uh, such gems in the ocean of chess because they do have the dedicated facilities. Because, you know, you can, if you're renting, you can get kicked out. 
you know, and, uh, you know, so the, the ability to stay in one location is almost priceless. Mm -hmm. It's hard to replicate. So yeah. I, I just uh, can't say enough about those two um, places in the, in the world of chess. So much history in both places. Um, you know, some of the world champions are, are famous. You've documented some of the, like uh, Lasker visiting the, the mechanics. And yes, he visited twice. He visited, I believe, in 1903 and 1926. And, and you know, the thing was, in those days, when they would visit, it wouldn't just be like a, a one-night uh, 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 simul. It would be like an extended stay for like a week or so because the economics, especially on the West Coast, were such that, you know, between Los Angeles and San Francisco, there wouldn't be any stops. And and also Los Angeles in 1903 wasn't a particularly big uh, city. It was much smaller than San Francisco. So it could have been that he went from somewhere like Salt Lake City to San Francisco. And, and then he's got to go all the way back again. And, you know, so it takes a lot of time. So if you're going to make it to the West Coast, you're definitely going to... Uh, Stick around. At that time, spend a little time there. And so he played not only simuls and gave lectures, but also played offhand games with members. Yeah. And so some. what are some of the other, who are the, some of the other uh, world champions that visited? Uh, well, pretty much every world champion uh, from Steinitz, who was the first in 1886, uh, he did not make it to the mechanics. But after him was Lasker. And so Lasker to, uh, say, uh, Kasparov, the champions of the uh, of the 20th century, everybody made it to the mechanics except for Kasparov and Bogdanik. But all the rest, you know, the Elekines, the Capoblancas, the Irvas, the Talls, the Smyslovs, Petrosians, uh, Karpov was the last to visit. Uh, uh, you know, they've all they Spassky, they all paid visits. Actually, Spassky was was in in the in the early 2000s, mid 2005 or so. Uh, you know, so. Uh, I got to watch Tal play Patrick Wolf in the mechanics. Yes, right. Because you organized, you were you and Neil Faulkner and um, Max Wilkerson were the organizers of that Pan Pacific, uh, one of the last tournaments of Tal's life in 1991. And it was held in Chinatown, but Tal flew from uh, uh, the Soviet Union, as it was still then, uh, I believe, to uh, San Francisco. And he did it on Aeroflot, which was the most uh, uh, convenient for his schedule and and probably the most, you know, probably a reasonably economic way to go. But it involved multiple stops to, uh, you know, Shannon, Ireland, and then to Ganders, Newfoundland, and then all the way to, you know, Vancouver and then down. And that was good for Tall because I think by that those days, you weren't allowed to smoke on the planes. And uh, multiple so stops. Tall, tall liked the multiple stops, you know, because he made his nicotine fix. He went out of his way to schedule multiple stops, probably. Probably so, probably so. <laughs> well, so did Bobby Fischer ever play at the Mechanics? Oh, uh, yes, he did. He played in 64. He uh, uh, gave a, a simul there at the Mechanics that year at, on 50 boards. And he had been at the club before in 1957 the U.S. Junior Open, oh, yes. or it was just called the U.S. Junior then because there was no yeah. closed uh, tournament. It was all the best junior players in the country, and he took first, uh, you know, and Gil Ramirez, a local, was second. And yeah. uh, uh, he spent about a week after that kind of hanging around the club. Uh, uh, one of the things that was very popular in those days when uh, chess clocks were not uh, in, uh, not that common was that he uh, – they played a lot of uh, – uh, uh, like move on move chess and you know you move I move you move I move it was kind of on the honor system but it was almost like uh, bullet chess and he did it with in tandem with uh, uh, with uh, uh, Gil Ramirez as his partner so that you know when I did my book Bobby Fisher in this world when I was doing the research for it I ran to some mechanics old timers that remembered that and they also remembered uh, the late William Addison uh, one of the strongest players in the United States yes. never to become a GM. He was an IM, like rated 2490 feet. Yeah. Uh, and a former director. And he uh, uh, was not, uh, he, had, he had not yet assumed the position as director of the mechanics, but in right. the late 50s, he was a 2300 plus master. Great. So he yeah. was uh, showing a lot of in-game studies to Bobby, who was solving them very quickly. And of course, all of you will know that uh, that summer of 57 was uh, a very important time in, in Bobby's career. Uh, it was uh, 
uh, at the end of that summer in August uh, that he went to the U.S. Open uh, in Cleveland, he actually left from the mechanics and uh, one of the key persons at the mechanics, Guthrie McLean, uh, lent uh, Bill Addison his car and he, it was Bill and like four or five other teenagers, Ramirez and uh, Fisher among them, and uh, John Ronaldo, I think, was another. And they drove, uh, this is before I-80, you know, which would be the natural route to get between uh, San right. Francisco and uh, Chicago. And so they drove in like McLean's vehicle. And, you know, so they were, you know, driving across, you know, Utah, you know, empty spaces. So Bobby got a, a good road trip in, but the car uh, broke down somewhere in, uh, I believe, in Nebraska. And uh, they paid for the repair and they moved on. But then it, uh, 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 in either Peoria or Joliet, it broke down a second time. And they were really afraid that, you know, like McLean, like, what did you do in my car? Yeah. So they got on the bus and then they, they met him. He flew to uh, Cleveland expecting to see his car there, uh, not realizing he would have to uh, get a ride back to pick it up in Illinois. And uh, it turned out it was some small part or something. But at any rate, uh, uh, you know, I sometimes think that uh, when they had all those interviews with Fisher in the 1990s, like in, say, 1992 during his rematch with Spassky, or in 96 uh, when he was in Argentina, when he was uh, doing his Fisher random chess, uh, you know, talks, I wish somebody had asked him instead of, you know, questions about chess politics and things like that, if they just said, hey, Bobby, do you remember that trip you made from the mechanics to Cleveland? Yeah. yeah, I would have, because he had a great memory. It would have been fun to hear some of the stories he had to say. Yeah, and to, to, to piggyback on this, you know, I, I want to say shout out to um, Neil Fauntner, a longtime trustee of the Mechanics Institute and the primary organizer of that 1991. I had a very bit part in that. I was more involved in the '95. I was the chief organizer of that tournament. Uh, Tal was was uh, no longer with us at that time. That was won by Kortschneid, though. So these were big tournaments. And Mark Pinto was one of the, Neil Falconer, Mark Pinto, and I were the organizing committee uh, for the 95 one. So both uh, Neil and Mark's uh, service to the Mechanics Institution can't go with, without mentioning. And Guthrie, uh, is emphasizing, and Guthrie McLean, I never got the chance to meet him, but he was a big buddy of uh, Bob Berger, uh, who was also a trustee of the Mechanics. And... Um, uh, uh, he, he wrote a book about Bobby Fisher, as you did, and um, uh, I got Guthrie and Bob were very in, involved in uh, publishing the Chess Reporter. Or was that right? The Cal yeah, the California Chess Reporter. California Chess seventy five uh, from nineteen fifty one to about nineteen seventy five. Thank you. Seventy six, something like that. Your your memory is so much sharper than mine, and uh, and also what I was so impressed about the quality of diagrams in that. That was, it was amazing for the times. Yes, it was. It really documented Northern California chess history really well. And I should say that uh, the book by Berger, I think it's like the chess of Bobby Fischer. It's a book worth seeking out. Uh, it takes a somewhat different approach. It uh, uh, Berger was not just a 2300 plus uh, USCF rated master, but he was a world-class chess problemist. And yes. uh, so it's kind of a teaching book. He, uh, he uses Fischer's games to show certain themes for... For example, uh, one of them is like the domination of the bishop over a knight. And I remember one of the examples he shows is uh, Fisher's uh, uh, win over uh, William Addison in uh, that Cleveland 57 U.S. Open where he, the knight's on E8. And he plays bishop E5 in an endgame and just totally dominates the knight and wins quite quite easily thereafter. Uh, so, yeah, if you're ever you know, visiting a used bookstore somewhere, or I think you might have even, your company might have reprinted it Hypermodern chess, you might have reprinted that back in I was thank you for remembering. Yes, I yeah. did reprint it. I so I worked with Bob extensively during that. Uh a great character, a great, you know, he was more of an, an advertising kind of guy, you know, marketing and and um he had a really good relationship with Herb Kane. So he, he would get chess mentioned in Herb Kane's column from for from time to time, or when we had a with a uh, an important tournament going on at the mechanics or associated with the mechanics. So those are good memories. And uh, Bob is no longer with us, but he was a, he was a great friend and that was a great book. And I did republish it as hypermodern press. And thanks for, for reminding me of that. Um, you know, so the other things I wanted to say, you mentioned uh, a book that you wrote. Is this it? 
Yes, it is. Okay, the Bobby Fischer and his world. So tell me a little bit about how did you go about doing this? How did you get this idea? Because I know you wrote about his, um, his uh, uh, schedule of his, his simultaneous exhibitions and, and this, did that spark your interest in writing this book? Uh, indirectly it did in the sense that uh, when I was gathering up games for the first edition of that book, which appeared in the uh, 1990s, uh, I met a lot of people who had uh, uh, hosted Fisher during that tour. Uh, it was uh, at a time when Fisher was much more approachable and he stayed at people's homes or they drove him from one city to another for an exhibition. And uh, the, uh, uh, the memories they shared with me were somewhat at odds with uh, uh, the later ways, you know, ways Fisher has been portrayed. I think, you know, part of that can be attributed to the fact that, you know, like most of us, you know, you, you change over time, but he changed maybe more than, 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 than others. Uh, but he was very, very approachable in those days. And so, but anyway, this book uh, was pretty much, I had read Endgame, Profile, Little Prodigy, pretty much anything I could find that was Fisher related. And there's like over a hundred books on him. If you go to Edward Winter's site, uh, Chess History, uh, there is a uh, chess notes. There's a, uh, a list of all the books on, uh, that have been ever published on Fisher. Uh, but after all that, I still had many questions. I had the opportunity to speak with a lot of people that knew Bobby, and uh, I just had a lot of unanswered questions. So this uh, book was an attempt to answer many of the questions I had. In many cases, I was uh, I had a lot of help, and I was I was successful in answering the questions. And in in some other cases, I, I you know I I don't know <laughs> maybe the answer will never be known, but uh, it was a very fun project to do. Uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about uh, uh, New York City and uh, the chess there in the late 1950s and uh, the uh, 1960s. I think that uh, uh, you know people kind of tend to forget now that uh, how uh, how much over uh, how much the, the the chess scene there was an overachiever. And what I mean by that is USCF membership before the Fisher boom. Uh, in the late 60s and early 70s was quite modest. Uh, you know, in 1960, I don't think they had even 5,000 members. Uh, but that didn't stop them uh, from producing a very good chess magazine, Chess Life. It started like around early 1960s. It had been in newspaper format before that. And, uh, you know, if you look at the chess players they had, you know, Fisher, Lombardi, uh, Evans, uh, Benko, uh, you know, uh, you know, Ruszewski, uh, they, they, you know, they were battling with Yugoslavia and with Argentina for number two in the Olympiads. Uh, you know, they really had a, a lot of, 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 of quality chess being played in New York City. And I think if Fisher hadn't grown up there, frankly, there was no chance that he would have ever uh, come close to achieving what he did. Um, as an example of that, I point to uh, Larry Remlinger, who at a similar age, that is like, you know, from 11 to 14, 11 to 13, say, was a markedly stronger player than Fisher was at the time, but being based in Long Beach, California, he didn't have the sort of opportunities Bobby did. And by the time he got into the 2300s, uh, you know, he basically just sort of hit a plateau. Uh, so uh, it was a very fun book to uh, to work on. And I've got two more in the pipeline. I've got one on Bobby Fisher and his writings, and I have another one on Fisher and his uh, non-tournament games planned. And Remlinger, interestingly enough, became an IM much later in life. Isn't yeah, he did. Obviously, he was a very talented player. You yeah. know, if he had been born, for example, in the Soviet Union instead of the United States at the same time, same time he would have become a grandmaster, you know, uh, as would have probably a lot of American players of that generation. Tony, uh, Tony Sadie's a, a little bit older than Larry, but he's another example of a player who, you know, uh, you know, worked a regular job during his life, in his case as a medical doctor, uh, and played chess as an amateur, but a very keen one. And uh, I think that if he, you know, in his formative years had, you know, access to good coaching and, and strong competition on a consistent basis, he yeah. would definitely have made it. And even a guy that I got to know well was Walter Shipman. And, uh, you know, he would tell me that you just can't play against these guys part time. No, no. He's another good example of somebody who, you know, worked as a lawyer. Uh, he was in, rated in the top 10 or 12 players in the U.S. around 1956. Uh, but, you know, he was working, you know, he had a family. And uh, it was only when he retired early, he retired in his early 19, in his early 
50s, I want to say, he became an I am, you know, somewhere like around 52 or 53. And uh, it was an example of, it wasn't like one of these uh, former Soviet players who were always, you know, who who couldn't travel outside of the country. He, he could have traveled at any time, but he had these uh, these other boundaries, if you will, that prohibited him from, from you know, playing in the type of tournaments that were needed to, to make norms. And once he had the path clear, he made it quite easily. Yeah, also, I like he was, I like he was also one of the great gentlemen of chess. Oh, right? absolutely. He, yeah. And um, that I will, I was going to save to the end, but John, you are as well. Uh, I have never heard anyone say bad things about you. Everyone has just complimentary things to say uh, because you've never, you you don't um, get involved in the political fights. You don't get involved in these, these, um, uh, you know, internet wars, uh, flaming and all of the stuff that goes on. You, you remain um, outside of that and you've always conducted yourself impeccably well, even when you're representing the United States and overseas in FIDE. Um, I just have to say, but Walter was, was that type of man as well. So I had great respect for him and that's why you're on my uh, season finale. I have I'll, I'll, I'll settle just for being in the same sentence with Walter. Yes, yes. Um, that that brings me to another. Um, <clears throat> you're, you're listed, uh, you know, as a player, an author, a journalist, and a chess official. You know, how do you want to be remembered? Oh gosh, uh, you know, I would say that uh, uh, probably, you know, for the books I've written, and maybe also for the Olympiad teams, you know. I've, I've had the opportunity to serve as the U.S. national team captain for o over 20 times in uh, Olympiads, World Team Championships, Pan American uh, Championships, what have you. And uh, so I've had the opportunity to uh, to realize just how weak a player I am. Well, you know, being amongst all the great players that have played for our Olympiad teams uh, uh, is a humbling experience. And uh, the U.S. has done really well. I mean, obviously now it's very obvious we have like all these world class players. Uh, before we had very strong players, but not like top 10 or top 15 players, or if we did, not for very many of them. Uh, you know, if you go back pre Hikaru and pre uh, 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 Gata, uh, but, uh, you know, we had a lot of depth, good team spirit. And uh, I think back to like, you know, the 1990s, the team that won the World Team Championship in 93 and nearly repeated in 97. Uh, those teams, you know, they were very balanced. Uh, the difference between board one and board six, because, well, that's the second reserve. And in those days, they did play on six boards and not five, uh, was was very small. I mean, Al Chermelinski uh, usually was our uh, standard bear. He, he was uh, always up for the challenge and did a great job. But the whole team as a whole was very balanced and uh, really, uh, 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 you know, came through on a consistent basis. They were meddling, you know, pretty much every time. Yeah, some of my uh, best chess friends, uh, and, and basically I was a fan during those days. Uh, you know, I was never in contention to represent the United States, um, but I was, uh, I followed them very closely. And uh, guys like Yermo and, and Fed and uh, Nick DeFermian, Joel Benjamin, you know, these are these are guys that I call friends now. So. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, Gre Gregory Kaidanov and Boris Gulko were amazing. another great guy. Another. But the, tr the tradition continues, and uh, the last two online Olympiads, you know, obviously because of the pandemic, uh, they weren't being held, held in person. Right. And uh, uh, scheduling, they were held. They were held on relatively short notice, uh, which precluded some of our our very top players from participating. For example, the top five in the most recent. Uh, 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 online Olympiad, which was held a, a few months ago. Uh, but despite that, uh, the uh, teams have, you know, this time we finished uh, second, uh, d upsetting India. And uh, I should say also the event uh, is, is, is worth checking out. It was quite interesting. Uh, it was played on two uh, uh, open boards, two uh, uh, adult female boards, two, and then one junior board and one junior girls board. Uh, so you know, uh, a little twist from the regular Olympiad where there are separate sections for open and, and women's competition and, and no juniors at all. And and this worked out quite interestingly. And uh, and our team, uh, you know, was not really expected to, to you know, maybe make the, the final eight, but nothing beyond that. But we managed to finish uh, 
second. So in some ways, sometimes that result kind of result is more satisfying than even winning gold when you have all the big guys. I'll take them both, mind you. Yes. But, uh, but uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, the U.S. has been blessed with uh, a, a long tradition of excellence in team events. Yeah, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit back more in depth um, because there's some there's a couple other things that we have in common. Um, <clears throat> but going back to the respect the world has of you, the you know the fact that, that you were the captain of all those Olympiad teams. I think there's two characteristics about John Donaldson that I want people to know is that the players respected you. And also that job requires an organizational skill that, you know, uh, being able to uh, rest players, being able to um, keep everybody uh, ready to play. You know, there's, there's a lot that goes into being captain to, if you're a good captain, which you uh, reportedly were, I only attended one. Uh, that uh, th to witness it in person, but um, you know that was the reputation that you had. That you took care of all the things the players didn't want to worry about. Well, I like to say that uh, if the uh, if the team does well, you should really blame it on the players because the captain can't get in there and play for them. Yeah. But if the team does poorly, then then the captain bears the fault. So that's right. You I go down with the ship. Right. <laughs> but uh, you mentioned that you had, which Olympiad did you attend? Was uh, it the one is simple, uh, 20, early in the 2000s. What was okay, it? so I missed you because I wasn't the captain for that one. Every Olympiad, the players vote for who their team captain is. And in 2000, I believe the captain might have been... Christensen? Yeah, I think it was Larry Christensen. Yeah. He did a really great job in 98 when the team nearly won gold and they finished silver. Uh, uh, but... What I would say to the audience is that if you ever have a chance to see, uh, you know, like if you got a bucket list of chess events to attend and, you know, maybe the world championship would be on it. I would say that even more enjoyable than a world championship is going to an Olympiad because it isn't just one single game. You know, you've got 180 countries competing and uh, you've got uh, chess officials from all over the world. You've got chess fans from all over the world. You have all sorts of, uh, chess book stalls and chess memorabilia. It's just a good way to catch a pretty heavy dose of chess fever, if you will. Yeah. And uh, the next Olympiad is scheduled for Moscow sometime next year. That might not be the right time for most people. Uh, you know, but the one following that in 2024 is in Budapest, which should be a lot more accessible. And uh, that would be one I would highly recommend checking out. I mean, uh, the events that are held in, you know, in the center of Europe, which is sort of the home ground of chess, if you will, uh, are usually always memory, memorable. And the Hungarians have a big chess tradition, so I think that would be a. a is it going to be in Buda or Pesh? I'm not sure. I don't know all the details. It's a little far out, you yeah. know, in time, yeah. but uh, a great but city it, to visit. It's, it's definitely near the Danube River. I'm sure. Yes, of yes. <laughs> That's when I was there. We were on a Danube River cruise and that was one of our stops uh, but um you know i i think that the olympiad was one of the highlights and also for a chess fan such as myself rubbing shoulders getting to talk to some of those grandmasters from other countries you know that was just great that was a fantastic experience for me and um you know i was there because i was uh, the uh, uh u.s i was the fide zone one president were you a fide I was. I was uh, in Dresden in 2008. 2008. That was once. That was probably enough. That's what I felt, too. <laughs> so we had that in common as well. Um, but the the idea is, is that uh, the U.S. Chess, which is the national governing organization, and FIDE, which is the international govern the world governing organization, um, the U.S. has a representative in that, and that's our FIDE rep. And then there, FIDE itself has a, it divides the world into zones. And um, you're supposed to represent FIDE in your zone. And the uh, US is so large that we're, we have a zone to ourselves. So the zonal president has got to represent FIDE's interests in their zone. So I found myself saying that, you know, this is what FIDE wants to do. And all the U.S. players would go, no. <laughs> <And it was> like, 
<laughs> so there you are in a rock and a hard place. And so that that was not a, a particularly fun experience, but it got to, got me to assemble. So uh, I would always remember that. And mm -hmm. we had a lot of great um, fide, it, like uh, I replaced uh, Arnold, Grandmaster Arnold Denker and uh, had many long conversations with him about uh, what what it's like to be in fide. But, you know, I also, Hyper Modern Press uh, published his, his book, Bobby Fisher, and, and the, that I knew in other stories. And, um, you know, Denker was just a character all in his own right. But uh, a lot of great players that uh, are great chess people that have taken those uh, positions in FIDE. And, but you also were on the uh, board of the U.S. Chess. Yes, I served from 1990 to 93. Right, and I did 96 to 99. So I think I'm just following in your footsteps all around the yeah. world. Or, or well, you're not learning from my experience. <laughs> yes, uh, it was, never mind. I don't want to get started and say something I regret later. But yeah, some of those things are difficult experiences and it's different than playing and being around chess players. Right, I, I would interject that I think that right now uh, the US Chess Federation is, uh, is doing quite well. I mean, well being relative pre-pandemic they were doing really excellent and uh, yes. what i mean by that is that uh you know they uh you know not shooting themselves in the foot uh going forward with uh, good programs uh yes. you know uh you know and and i'm sure that uh you know like many organizations are facing some challenges now because of, of covid the pandemic but, right but but once you know things lift i think there's going to be a takeoff there there's so many, you know, young players that were probably inspired to play by, you know, the Queen's Gambit or that become, you know, have become more keener uh, from playing online. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, adults. Uh, I direct a Friday night tournament at the Berkeley Chess Club, and uh, uh, I see this trend recently where you have adults that are unrated that are like in their 20s, you know, like say a tech worker, if you will. And their first rating's like 1600 or 1800. And that's not the way it used to be. They used to, you know, they'd pay, pick, pick up somewhere around 1000 or 1100 and, and then they worked their way slowly up if they did. Uh, but nowadays they come in having played like, you know, hundreds if not thousands of games online. They, they've done all these, you know, tactical yes. drills and yes. they're, they're much more accomplished than the, the, the unrateds of old, if you will. Yes. So, so it's definitely a different uh, chess world. Yeah. I had a series uh, called uh, Unsung Chess Heroes, and I'm going to have, uh, if I start that up again, I'm going to have Chuck Unruh from uh, the U.S. Chess Board, current board, their treasurer, uh, on, because, uh, you know, I think what they've really done so well compared to when I was experiencing is their finances are in much better shape. There's more transparency. They're just... Do it, right. well, it with a pandemic. Well, they survived it. Right. Well, I think that one thing I think of in the past is that, you know, in, uh, you know, you know, decades before, it always seemed like every so often something would happen, whether it be like, you know, a lawsuit or it would be, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, some dispute involving an employee and having to make a payout, payout you know, to preempt a lawsuit. There would always be something like that where they'd shoot themselves in the foot. And I mean, just, you know, there's tremendous goodwill from the USCF membership. And uh, they're, you know, both in terms of like, you know, just their like lifelong commitment to chess and they, they help in their, both their time and their, their, their money. And uh, so, so there was always that great asset to, uh, to, to tap, but on the other hand, sometimes they would sort of be these self-inflicted wounds, and I just don't see that happening anymore. Right. You know, knock on wood, and so you know, the, the, everything seems to be running. You know, from the outside, it looks quite good. You know, so yeah. yeah. And of course, it doesn't yeah. help with all this. You know, have it doesn't hurt to have you know uh, Rex and Jeannie Singfield in St. Louis, and you know, and that's and, on to my next topic, John, because okay. uh, sure. I'm running out of time. But, sure. Uh, I do want to bring up uh, the Chess Hall of Fame and the St. Louis Chess Club. What a it, St. Louis has become the mecca of chess. It used to be New York City, without a doubt, for my most of my chess playing career. And the Singfields have uh, 
done a tremendous job uh, running the U.S. championships, women's championships. Uh, they've got all sorts of scholastic programs going on. There's nothing that they don't do. Uh, to, but they also built the uh, U.S. Chess Hall of Fame. And um, part of my background, I was on the U.S. Chess Trust uh, for, for 20 years. I was president for 10. And we nominate people for the U.S. Chess Hall of Fame. And one of the the, what we do is we get a recommendation in the past, this has now changed, but from the um, Hall of Fame Committee from U.S. Chess, and you were the chairman of that, or you were one of those people that we always look for your recommendations. Before we would do any nomination, we would check with John Donaldson. And I'm just going to show off my World Chess Hall of Fame shirt. St. Louis, Missouri is in the bottom line. I don't know if you can read it. But... Um, that is a wonderful structure. If you get a chance to go to St. Louis, check out the St. Louis Chess Club or check out the, the Hall of Fame or both. Um, but but that, what they have done in St. Louis is, is fantastic. And I could not have dreamed of it when I was growing up playing chess. Um, but you know, tell me about how do you de decide who gets into the Hall of Fame? Well, there's a, uh, as you mentioned, uh, USCF members are welcome to uh, nominate individuals. And then there's also a committee, and the committee's uh, uh, usually about 10 people, and it's uh, uh, a, a mixture of uh, chess historians, uh, people like uh, uh, John McCrary, who's the current chairman. Shout out, John. Uh, John Hilbert, who's uh, arguably, I think, probably, in my opinion, the greatest American chess historian. He, he's written many fine books uh, published by McFarland Press primarily. Yes. And uh, yeah. then there's a Hall of Famers like uh, Andy Soltis, uh, you know, rep, you know, represent. You know, he's also a chess historian and writer, but he's yeah. also a fine player as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so there, there's this group of uh, of about ten of us. Uh, Fred Wilson, the the the, the longtime chess historian and book dealer, is another yes. member of the committee. Shout out to Fred. Uh, yeah. So at any rate, all these people get together and we discuss. And uh, typically, uh, uh, you know, we're looking for somebody that's you know. Uh, you know, chess is different than other sports in that people have long careers, uh, but we're looking for somebody who's on the, you know, maybe on the downward side of their careers. So, for example, like, Gata Komsky was not inducted into the Hall of Fame while he was playing a world championship match with Veselin Topolov, but although he still plays at a very high level and is rated in the top 100 in the world, he did get inducted. Uh, ditto for Alex Onershuk. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it's kind of a who's who of a, uh, uh, American chess, you've got the world champions, Bobby Fischer and uh, William Steinitz. Yes. Uh, you've got uh, correspondence uh, world champions like uh, uh, Hans Berliner and, and Viktor uh, Palchiakis. Yep. Uh, you've got some of the uh, top women players of all time like Diane Severi. I would expect that sometime in the not too distant future that uh, uh, Irina Krush and Anna Zatonsky will be be inducted, you know. Irina Krush, eight-time woman's champion and uh you know i asked her about that once you know and she said she's not done yet <laughs> no no but uh uh you know it, not so easy there's a lot of strong uh women coming up no nope. everybody's been making a big deal about you know yep. our uh, huge you know uh and arguably so uh uh you know list of top men you know with with uh fabiano and with uh um uh, uh, dominguez and wesley so uh with uh, uh, Levon Aronian around the corner with Sam Shanklin and Sam Shanklin, uh, I wanted to shout uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Zhang and Ray Robson and, yeah. and Sam Chevy, Sevian, who did so well in the U.S. Championship. So there's all of them. But on the other side, there's players like uh, Carissa Yip and uh, this young lady that just came from, uh, you know, that's going to school in Missouri uh, uh, with the unpronounceable na last name from Uzbekistan that goes by uh, uh, Beacom, I think. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm even getting that part of it wrong, but, I, I uh, but there's so that. many there, there, if you look at, it used to be, you know, 20 years ago, if you were an expert, you could play in the U S women's championship. Now you got to be over 2300, 2350 plus. But one event I would really have people be on the lookout for is in, uh, 2022, the world chess hall of fame will be holding a uh, special exhibition on Bobby Fisher. They've had an, exhibitions on him before but you can guess 2022 it's 50 years after Reykjavik 
Um, what will make this exhibition different will, is it'll be bigger and better. It will be on all three floors of the uh, World Chess Hall of Fame. They've never done that before. All the other exhibitions have been confined to a single floor, but this will take a, a very comprehensive look at Fisher's career from beginning to end, you know, emphasizing 1972, but also, you know, you know, explaining like, you know, how did he get good? You know, who are the people that helped him? Uh, what were the, the the roadblocks that stopped him from you know immediately becoming a world champion in the early 1960s? Uh, how did he break through? And uh, you know, and what was his like after winning the championship? All those topics will probably be covered in the exhibition. And the World Chess Hall of Fame is uh, very much interested in hearing about anybody that has uh, Fisher-related stories that they were personally involved in or uh, yeah. any sort of Fisher-related memorabilia. That to mention that. That. I wanted to ask you about that. That's going to be a great event. And if you have any Fisher uh, stories or, or paraphernalia, you know, please get in contact with St. Louis. And um, we also wanted to mention that, and this is a picture of me and Joel Benjamin, who's the only person who's won the U.S. Senior, Junior, and U.S. Championships. Uh, but this is the Cairns Club. Uh, that we, I was in St. Louis for, uh, that, that's the championship for the women's now. So everything is changing in, and uh, so much goes out, you know, so, much, so much of our, our um, we have to express our appreciation, deep appreciation for what the Seinfelds have done in St. Louis for U.S. chess. And uh, John, is there anything else that I should ask you before we go? Because I am running out of time. I, th I think you covered it well, Jim. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, it, this is my final episode for season one of The Chess Files. The answers are out there. And I wanted in especially to have you on as my, my guest because I think of you as a historian as well. You know, you dates roll off of your tongue. Uh, you know, you had two GM norms, you, you know, not to be dismissed as a, as a weak player like myself because uh, I could fight with them, you know, but I... Uh, I could, well, let's see, yeah. I could fight with a grandmaster, but I couldn't become one. And uh, it was one of those things, you know, they're just too strong. There's Alex Yermolinsky, who you mentioned before. And uh, I think that this is, uh, you, you've been involved in all aspects of chess, you know, from starting out in Tacoma, uh, to representing the United States in FIDE, to being an Olympian camp captain, uh, to be on the board of the National Governing Organization. Uh, so, you're just the best guest I could possibly hope for to wrap up this season. And I want to thank you again and express my admiration for you and what all you've accomplished. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me, John. Okay. I'm going to take you backstage now and say goodbye. Okay. Bye, John. See you later. That was John Donaldson, a tremendous uh, force in U.S. chess. And I, I can't really call him an unsung hero because uh, he's done so much for so many ways. And the E Foundation has been trying to do that much around the world. Uh, we've been expressing, you know, doing our, our best to help others get started. And where they go from there, it's up to them. But we can get you started. If you can't access the internet chess community, we can get you started to build a community where you are. Uh, just a second, I'm gonna change my background. There we go. We can get you started building a community wherever you are, whatever language you speak, whatever country you're in, doesn't matter. You can start get started building communities wherever you are through chess. And that's what the Eid Foundation is trying to do. Uh, our guest was John Donaldson. He wrote the uh, Bobby Fischer and His World. It's available now at all chess outlets, I'm sure. You, cannot have, you won't have any trouble finding it. I recommend it highly, I own it. Um, I don't have it signed yet, but um, I'm going to get that done one day. Uh, and that's it for season one of The Chess Files. The answers are out there.